Can you please raise your hand if you agree with this statement? There is no gravity in space, so astronauts on the International Space Station float. And there should be none of my students with hands up. Okay. Um, un unfortunately, if you did raise your hands, you fell into the trap that many people fall into. It's a very commonly held misconception. Of course there is gravity in space. In order to escape Earth's gravity, it is necessary to either become massless, like a neutrino perhaps, or to find a place where you are infinitely far from the centre of the Earth. In other words, it's impossible. It's impossible because you can't lose your mass, and you can't be infinitely far from the centre of the Earth. Also, of course astronauts do not float. Floating means they would have to be in some kind of liquid, which clearly they are not. So what is going on here? What's the problem? Why do astronauts appear to be avoiding gravity and floating around the ISS? Well, as a physics teacher, I would say it's because of the gravitational force pulling them towards the centre of Earth along with the whole ISS, uh, ISS itself. So why do they never reach the surface of Earth? We do. If we jump out of a window, we get to the surface of Earth. Well, it's because, of course, the astronaut and the ISS itself are travelling extremely fast, orbiting the Earth. That means going around the Earth. And as soon as they've fallen a little bit, the Earth itself has fallen as well, rotated around a bit. So, even though they're falling, they make no progress. They are in free fall, but never land. Raise your hand if you agree with the following statement. My weight is 70 kilograms. Okay, I'm looking. Not so many hands this time. Unfortunately, if you did raise your hands, you're either not 70 kilograms or you fell into the trap that many people fall into. It's a very commonly held misconception. Of course, what this person should have said is either uh, my mass is 70 kilograms or my weight is 687 newtons. So what's going on here? Well, it's all down to the definitions of mass and weight. An object's mass is simply a measure of how much stuff that object is made up of. That's the atoms, the, the particles it's made up of. And it's measured in kilograms. There is another way to think about mass. An object's ability to resist motion, so-called inertial mass, but let's not go there for now. Weight, on the other hand, is defined as the force of gravity exerted by a celestial object like the Earth on an object that is on or near it and therefore is subject to its gravitational field. As it is a force, it's measured in newtons and can be reasonably easily measured with, for example, a pair of bathroom scales. So when a person says they have weighed themselves using a pair of bathroom scales, they are correct. But the vast majority of bathroom scales are actually calibrated in kilograms, so we'll give the person an answer for their weight in kilograms. In other words, incorrect. So, and as my students know, if anyone asks me the best way to lose weight, I rather facetiously say, well, there are two ways to do this. You can either lose mass or you can move to a celestial object where the gravitational field is weaker. For example, the moon or planet Mars. Raise your hand, and this is the final time, if you agree with the following statement. Speed is the same as velocity. Nobody. Oh, there's two over here. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's one at the back as well. Thank you. Well, you've all cottoned onto this, haven't you? It's a common misconception. Unfortunately, if you did raise your hand, you fell into the trap that many people fall into. It's a very commonly held misconception. Of course, speed and velocity are related, 
but there are important differences between them. So what's going on here? Well, yet again, it's down to the definitions of speed and velocity. Put simply, an object speed is a measure of how fast it's going. We all know that, and it's measured in everyday life, usually in kilometers per hour. Velocity, on the other hand, is also a measure of how fast an object is traveling, with the added extra ingredient of direction. For example, if a car is driving east on the third ring road at 50 kilometers an hour, actually that's pretty unlikely, but it's possible, <laughs> we could say that its speed is 50 kilometers an hour, but its velocity would be 50 kilometers an hour east. That extra directional information turns a speed into a velocity. One of the implications of this is that, of course, a velocity can be negative, because actually positive and negative are equally good at indicating direction as north, south, east or west. But you can't get slower than zero speed. Well, maybe some of the students at this school, but most people it's not possible. So speed cannot be negative. Another example where this is quite interesting is to think about a satellite orbiting the Earth once every 24 hours, a so-called geostationary satellite. In order to get around the Earth in 24 hours, it must travel at a constant speed of 3.07 kilometers per hour. That's quite fast. However, it's traveling in roughly a circle, so its direction is constantly changing. Therefore, its velocity is changing. Its speed is constant, its velocity is changing. Interesting for a physics teacher and physics students. So, why are these misconceptions held by so many people? What's going on? Actually, not many of you raise your hand, so maybe they're not so commonly held, in this room at least. What's going on? Well, maybe it's to do with language. That's my first suggestion. As was said earlier by Elizabeth, I had the good fortune to work as a science teacher, a physics teacher in a school in Turkey a few years ago. Most of my students were Turkish speakers, and I remember their confusion when I tried to explain the difference between speed and velocity. But, Mr. Burslem, they said, in Turkish there is no distinction made. Speed and velocity translate as the same word. And that word in Turkish is huz. How do we tell the difference, they asked me. Actually, in my subsequent experience, actually most of them never really did tell the difference. And it was a course of constant difficulty for them. But I suggested at the time they could figure it out by looking at the context within which the word was being used. Uh, which on top of, you've just got to know it, was all I could think about telling them at the time. Another language in which speed and velocity translate as the same word is German. Geschwindigkeit. Apologies for my accent. And there are probably others I would imagine. In fact, my Spanish-speaking friends tell me in Spanish, speed and velocity translate as the same word. So, maybe it's not a language problem per se, but an English language problem. Why, in English, is it necessary to use two separate words for speed and velocity, when in other language, languages, one is considered sufficient. A pedant might suggest that two completely different words are required as speed and velocity describe two separate quantities, and they would be right to an extent. Apparently German physics teachers, and I've read about this, when talking about velocity rather than speed, sometimes add the word vector to Geschwindigkeit, to turn it into Geschwindigkeit vector, indicating that in that context the direction of movement is important. How sensible is that? A student would immediately know what was being talked about, and even if they didn't, they could probably work it out by simply breaking down the word into its constituent parts. Maybe I should invent a new word for the English language instead of velocity. Maybe something like speed with direction, or one word. Why not? For English language learners, it would make more sense and would save them the trauma of yet another unique word 
to be added to their already long vocab lists. It's not just speed and velocity. There are many other such examples in science and physics and in everyday life, some of, I, some of which I've used in this talk this afternoon. Mass, weight, weightless, the classic one, weightless. I wonder whether over time, as the English language develops, uh, inevitably borrows from other languages, as it always has and always will, superfluous words will be dumped in favour of a more simple but a more useful approach to word building. So language, what else could be the root of the problem? Maybe it's to do with schools. And I'm going to bring in the theme of crossroads at this point. As a science educator in the international sector, I perhaps am continually encountering crossroads. That is a choice of ways. I and my colleagues that make up a school can continue straight on, that means not deviate, and just hope that students leave our care with no misconceptions, or we can choose to turn left or right. That means try something new that better encourages and challenges students to really think about the language they use when considering science contexts. I'm going to give you an example of this. Currently, the students in my school, which is this school, at least in the secondary section, that's grades 6 through 12, do lessons in individual subjects that typically last 45 or 90 minutes, depending on whether they have a single or a double period. For example, this year I see my grade 7 students for 45 minutes on a Monday morning, 90 minutes on a Wednesday, and 90 minutes on a Friday every week. This means, let's think about this, this means that any new vocabulary that they get exposed to in their science lesson on a Monday morning may not again enter their minds until Wednesday morning. That's 48 hours later. In other words, the structure of the way that lessons are delivered almost forces students to compartmentalise their language acquisition. Surely, I'm told by my language acquisition colleagues, language is best acquired through a steady drip feed approach rather than a sudden onslaught with long periods of inaction in between. I'm not suggesting that there are not good reasons why schools like this one are structured in the way they are. Of course there are good reasons often beyond the control of individual schools, especially in higher grade levels. But it might be the case that the current structure does not optimise language acquisition in the way that it could. Imagine if my grade 7 science students, instead of leaving me on a Monday morning and forgetting all the new words that they have been exposed to, continue to think about and be exposed to the same kind of vocabulary but in a slightly different context. What I'm talking about here could be described as project-based learning, in which students learn through themes approaching the theme from various points of view. For example, the theme could be motion, and the students could learn about the science of motion, speed, velocity, weightlessness, alongside, perhaps, the use of motion in poetry, art, or music. This, of course, is not a new idea. Elementary schools have been doing it for decades, probably centuries. But there are now some secondary schools that are experimenting with it. I was fortunate to visit Shanghai American School last autumn and saw how they have implemented a project-based learning approach in a section of their secondary school. Students are able to choose to follow this pathway and roughly half of them do. The other half follow a traditional subject-based pathway. I spoke to some of the students involved who were all English language acquisition students and they spoke highly of the programme emphasising its ability to break down barriers between subjects and enhancing broader understanding of language. Perhaps it's time for more schools to look at this approach. Thank you.